Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm here only till Sunday, and so I'm not going to be here uh, uh, in the weeks two and three. But I'm so jealous about you know the idea, especially of bringing together cosmology and philosophy in week three, that I thought I should you know try to preempt some of that discussion, maybe, and uh, open up some some issues that might come up in the third week. Uh, now, just so that uh, I can selfishly partake of this <laughs> that, that uh, interaction to some extent. Uh, and so uh, I thought uh, instead of just coming with a kind of uh, canned talk, say on gravity and the past hypothesis or something like that, that I would instead uh, talk about some issues about an explanation that maybe will come up with cosmology, but bouncing off of the stuff that we just that you know, David just did uh, the last two days. So, the downside of not having a canned talk is that really I have no idea what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> and so, I'm just going to kind of freely emote <laughs> or, or something. Uh, but, uh, to try to put a little more definition on it, I, I, you know, so if you think of this as maybe a title, uh, where I thought maybe what I could do is for the first uh, half hour or hour, Talk about whether we uh, uh, kind of alternative perspective on, on what we've just heard with with David's uh, uh, lectures yesterday, and then uh, turn to stuff about explanation uh, and the past hypothesis, and also extending some of that to thinking about explanation uh, and inflation in, in cosmology. Uh, so uh, the first half then would be you know whether we really need a kind of global past hypothesis in, in the way David. Uh, suggests, and then the second half is thinking. Well, okay, assume assume we do. Uh, do we? Then, then there's a question where you know people say that we, you know, it's a it's a big open problem in physics. Uh, you know, one of the top ten problems in physics. Sometimes you see on these lists of open problems and open, deep, and important problems in physics is you know explaining that initial state. And so we'll ask. I'll talk about that. But then that will naturally lead into some issues about cosmology, about explaining initial states in cosmology. Uh, and so I don't really have any particular axe to grind really about any of it, uh, but I just want to raise various questions uh, that hopefully will come up in week three. Okay, so with regard to the first bit, um, well, some of you, especially if it's the first time you, you've encountered the material, you know, when you encountered uh, David's way of thinking about uh, statistical mechanics, it may strike you as a bit odd uh, in some ways. You know, so if, suppose you've just come off a, a statistical mechanics uh, physics course, and say you went through the Huang textbook or something, and you were going, you know, learning all the stuff about microcanonical ensembles and canonical ensembles, applying it to three or four different types of gases and maybe a couple of liquids. Uh, and you know most of those uh, uh, you know gases and that don't have interactions and you have all you know just very limited sort of ideal systems. Uh, so on the one hand you've got you know and you're doing all this endless calculations of you know all these different integrals, and so you think of that as statistical mechanics, and then you know and then you come here to uh, this uh, you know philosophy week, and all of a sudden you hear David talking about statistical mechanics and it explains. You know, not just that stuff, but also you know where, uh, what drawer you typically put the, your toothbrush in in the morning, what parts of your body you typically scratch, and all sorts of other things. <laughs> and so you then have, so you might notice this kind of disconnect between the two, and think, whoa, you know, does the statistical mechanics, does that theory that I was learning in the Huang book, did that really you know tell me you know have the implication that? It's going to tell me where I typically scratch, uh, you know, make that, that generalization the most probable one. Uh, so, you know, as David, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, says, you know, his theory has this kind of, I don't know uh, what the right adjectives are, but, you know, imperialistic or, I don't know, megalomaniacal <laughs> ambitions for statistical mechanics. And, and you can see why. There's great pressure. You know, once you start thinking through the reversibility paradox, the Boltzmann brains problem, which incidentally, you know, if you know philosophy, then you know the Putnam's brains and bat problem. And so I think you should think of it as the Boltzmann brains and bats. And so you can have all these Boltzmann brains attached to bats. Which, and then so if you solve the Boltzmann brain problem, you still 
you're still <laughs> you're still you're, you're still in a skeptical scenario. Anyway, uh, but you know you have this uh, you know uh, kind of inexorable pressure and thinking consistently through you know how to handle the reversibility objections, pushing you all the way back to the, that past hypothesis, and and then once you put that uh, you know slap that uh, uh, probability. Uh, 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 measure on the initial state, then you know what David says is right. You know, then you're going to have that's just mechanics that it, it, uh, through that probability measure is really going to have this kind of you know almost like a kind of grain unified uh, theory in a way. It's you know th those those chances are going to be operative throughout all you know uh, with regard to all generalizations uh, 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 of, of different macrostates. So is there a way of Avoiding this. Uh, well, in the history of foundations of statistical mechanics, uh, there, there have been many attempts, and many of them, I think, fail. Uh, so, if you think of, you know, the, the, probably the most famous one is the Reichenbach branch. What system. does this refer to, though? When you say avoiding this, uh, the imperialistic. You know, but uh, you can avoid the imperialistic part by not being so imperialistic and still having a, the past that part. Uh, I mean, that's what, that's what I would call the standard view, and a quasi-standard view in foundations of statistical mechanics, but it doesn't include the imperialistic part. Uh, okay, so how does that go? You don't take the original measure quite so seriously as giving you probabilities <laughs> and stuff happening now, but you, you, nobody, I mean, David does a systematic analysis of that measure and what, and what it should mean and so on and so forth, but that's not the standard view about it. Right. Uh, but, but there's still a past hypothesis. Um, You're, I mean, I'm wondering if you, whether you want to separate. Yeah, yeah. So we, there are different. Yeah. So there maybe maybe there are different possible. Yeah. So that's why the the first thing I want to talk about. Maybe there are different ways of avoiding the imperialistic. Uh, you, know, you could say there's this weak past hypothesis, a medium past hypothesis, a strong past hypothesis. There's probably not yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I want to. Yeah. So it's, what, can I understand? I'm just. I want to understand better what Shelley is saying too. That so you mean, for example, you have a past. If you have a hypothesis about the initial macro state, um, but then, but but you don't you don't impose a specific probability distribution. You just don't take it that. Yeah, you don't right. think. So yeah. you have a kind of typicality <laughs> approach or something. But yeah, then, or, or maybe I maybe something else. I mean, but uh, but I, I think Craig is worried about something different. I mean, even on an approach like that. There won't be any detail of the history of the universe about which it can't be asked: Is this or is this not part of a typical? Uh, uh, you know, is is this or is this not typical for trajectories coming yeah, out of yeah. that? That is, there won't be there won't be areas of our experience like where you scratch that this simply won't apply to. So it won't it won't be avoiding that. I take it. They may not apply to that, but of course, I just, you, know, you have to do a little more work to see that it applies. I mean, detailed probability of where you're going to. That's put. absolutely right. So, but there won't be any. So at least the there won't be anything to, be to which it's irrelevant. Uh, absolutely, and an important question, and I don't know if that will come up at the conference, right. the summer school, is to what kind of things are these considerations universally regarded as, as relevant? Right, right. And some things, for whatever reason, people think, it doesn't seem relevant to that. I, I think, I mean, Craig, correct me if I'm wrong. You're no, I think you're right. I'm worried that it will still be, yeah, that, that Shelley's view, view will still have this. That's this right. So, and you're looking for that's ways where it could be just irrelevant. To certain that's right. Things. Totally right. irrelevant. Right, that's right. So you're arguing not so much against David only, but against the standard view in statistical mechanics about the found origin of irreversibility. Uh, well, I'm going to accept all these little mini past hypotheses. No, but uh, okay. let's say the Feynman that's view, that's what I've got yeah, the Boltzmann yeah. view, yeah. Yeah. Hmm? the Leibowitz view. That's what you're yeah. arguing against. Uh, well, I don't know. That, I don't know. I mean, well, you know better <laughs> that, uh, that what their views are, but uh, you know when. Well, let me say what the view is, and then, then we'll I mean, see I what. I think the answer is uh, yes. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I just want to know what, what you know. Yeah, well, okay, let me say the view. But for, yeah, so, but the one motivation for the view is, is you know, to try to get around these imperialist, imperialistic consequences. Another, there are, there are a bunch of different uh, sort of strands, I think, motivating this in some ways. 
Another one is that it's, it's going to be very hard to define uh, an, uh, an entropy for the, for the early system, early states of the of, of um, uh, the universe. We don't really know how to do that. Uh, you want know, to add in gravity and add in all these other uh, forces and and that. Uh, from laws of nature, there's a sort of uh, alternative version of uh, the kind of theory of laws of nature that David has, uh, that my colleague uh, Jonathan Cohen and I have developed. And it just so happens that it fits very nicely with this view, I think. And so there's a kind of uh, nice fit uh, between a certain view of laws, which I independently like, and uh, this particular type of view. Uh, and you know, since I developed the two things independently, and then only later noticed I mean, it's true that the common cause and that they came from my brain, but it, but it seems independent. You know, when you have got that kind of independence, that seems extra confirmed. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, and if you don't really like this idea that you know that wherever you put that past hypothesis, there's then going to be a turnaround point that the entropy is going uh, up. You know, just prior. You know, so you've got this anti-thermodynamic uh, behavior just prior to wherever you impose that. If you don't like that, this, this kind of view would also be, uh, get rid of that. Why, why is that, right? Uh, because there won't be, there won't be a global high path of hypothesis. If you phase early enough, the, the system doesn't make that equilibrium. You phase early enough that the system doesn't make that equilibrium while you're this, and... Uh, yes, so if, so on this kind of view, uh, you know, uh, you're just not going to be taking the, the, uh, Statistical postulate uh, that seriously, or it's just going to not. It's just going to. It's going to be basically kind of view like like Tim was mentioning of yeah. just just slapping it onto certain systems. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe, or, or not looking. Thing, I, think, I think you get the anti-thermodynamic behavior if you impose it early enough in the in, in the universe that you that you're in the period where you have got low equilibrium. Oh, where? Oh, where? Where, where you got low equilibrium? So. Oh. oh, oh uh, yeah, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there may not be then that consequence, in which case this would not be a virtue. Uh, okay, so first let me uh, quickly sketch the, the idea of uh, this alternative picture of laws uh, for a couple of minutes, and then uh, uh, this alternative picture of uh, the past hypothesis, uh, and then look at some challenges to it. So it's not like I'm in love with the view, really. In some ways, given the way I used to think about things, it just seems like straightforwardly cheating in some ways. But on the other hand, you can uh, tell yourself a, a, an interesting story to motivate this kind of cheating, so it doesn't seem like cheating. Uh, okay, uh, so here's another way. Th so uh, David talked about the best, uh, what's sometimes called the best system theory of laws of nature, this kind of Humean theory of laws of nature, where, where uh, laws of nature, what are they there? this kind of uh, systematization, kind of elegant summary of, of what, what happens. And, you know, I've always liked this because I thought of science, you know, that this is the way science proceeds where, you know, what you're trying to do is try to come up with the, these kind of uh, generalizations that are the result of a, a kind of maximization of, you know, trying to maximize different virtues. And so you get these theoretical virtues of simplicity, uh, power, unification, a bunch of things like that. And then you've got empirical virtues, and so you've got, and then you've got some kind of balancing act where you're trying to, you know, find something that would fit one, you know, maximize th these different virtues. Uh, and so you can think of it uh, the way Lewis did, but you can also think of it, you know, uh, so there's a paper by uh, Ned Hall where he thinks of it instead as, you know, you have a kind of ideal observer theory. And so you have, and so what, what the laws are is what the ideal observer, you know, the scientist who knows more than you, knows better and can articulate better the standards in the field for simplicity, uh, unification, all sorts of other virtues, and uh, then, you know, looks and then knows all the, all the relevant facts in that area of inquiry, and then spits out, you know, does calculate some function to, you know, to, to optimize uh, the different virtues, and then spits out some generalizations, and those are the laws. I forget what Ned calls it, but let's imagine you know, you've got this ideal observer. Let's call her Sally, for here she is. Okay, uh, and Sally is a C 
super awesome law giving intelligence. What <laughs> <laughs> so, you do is you spend, so Sally knows, you know, all this looks at the mosaic of all the facts relevant to a certain field. Uh, and she knows all the different virtues that people care about in that area. Uh, and so she calculates some function of a bunch of different virtues and you know, tries to maximize those and then spits out, you know, here, here are the laws in that area. Uh, and so we can be wrong about the laws because we, 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 we're, we're not ideal observers, we don't have, we're not, we, 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 can't, we try to calculate that function but we can't really, we're, we're, you know, we're simpler beings and so we can't really uh, do it adequately, we don't know all the information and so it's, as we get more data in science then, you know, then we'll change what we think of as the best theory uh, and then and we're sort of hoping that we're gradually approaching whatever it is that Sally's going to spit out. And the uh, idea here is that, uh, well, the idea that uh, Jonathan and I had was, which we had independently because of some, we had some complaints about the Lewis picture. So the Lewis picture, it always advertises itself as better than alternatives uh, because it's supposed to be more empirical and more accessible in some way. And so uh, it'll say about the governing view, it'll say about, say, the Armstrong view of laws of nature, it'll say, you know, the, the Lewisian will always complain about the Armstrongian and say, you know, you are Armstrongian, you say that some generalizations are, are laws, other true generalizations are not laws, but how can we tell? You know, and Armstrong famously puts a big N for the necessity symbol, uh, you know, on some generalizations and not others. But how can you ever tell, you know, if you've got a true universal generalization, one law-like, the other one not, not law-like, you know, how can you tell whether there's this big N somewhere in, in the world, uh, you know, picking out one rather than the other? Uh, on Thule's view, instead of N, he has an arrow. Like, well, how can I tell if there's an arrow? And so it just seems uh, that it's built in this kind of inaccessibility. But then the Lewis view has this kind of inaccessibility too. Uh, and so from this, you know, that is, you don't know, so the Lewis view has to pick privileged the privileged fundamental natural predicates. If you don't pick the right predicates, then it's not a law on the Lewis view. So you could be, you know, have these true universal generalizations, but it, and they could, you know, completely kick ass in science for, for all of time, and yet they might not be laws because they weren't, you didn't pick the right vocabulary. Uh, how could you tell? Well, you can't tell, and so this is kind of built in inaccessibility. And so from this point of view, this common charge that the Lewisian makes against the Armstrongian is really the, the, the Lewisian making that charge really has some nerve because they've got the same exact problem. And so uh, Jonathan and I didn't like this uh, the, this feature, and we thought of trying to uh, modify the view so that it didn't have this. Yeah, Craig, I just, um, Barry claims that his development of the Lewisian view doesn't have a problem like this. That is, you get the you get the fundamental variables and the laws together. Yeah, I think you, you have, have to do. Thoughts, do you have an opinion about that? Yeah, I mean, our our, our view is like that uh, too, uh -huh. where you uh, pick the you know so the predicates and the laws come together. Right. Uh, it's in some ways the same. Uh, so another diff. Yeah. So along those lines, then then the, uh, then the. Uh, Jonathan's view in mind uh, is roughly the same as Barry's. I see. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, there is a big difference, though, and that. Uh, well, first, another way to think about this. Or, well, no, let me see that. Uh, another difference, though, is that when we once you start thinking along these lines, then you mm -hmm. think, and so you opened it up so that now there's not a kind of privileged vocabulary, and you look around at all these different sciences. You know, all the different special sciences, biology, economics, and uh, all sorts of different uh, ecology. Uh, well, there's all these philosophers who say there are no laws in those, uh, those sciences. They're all basically wrong, I think. Uh, there are these kind of, you know, projectable generalizations in all of those areas, I think. And that's what I'm really after. And you can see that what those, what those people are doing in those fields is the same thing as what's going on in physics. And they're trying to do, you know, so that, so that there's all these other sallies 
so there's the you know, physicist Sally using the predicates of, of physics, but there's also biology uh, Sally who's uh, using the predicates of biology. There's ecology Sally. There's the economic Sally. There are all these different Sallies who are all these different ideal observers confined, you know, who are calculating from uh, you know this function f and spinning out projectable generalizations uh, in those different fields. And it's exactly the same way as in physics. And so once you've sort of said, well, there isn't a privileged vocabulary, it then you know, invites this idea that there's all these different best systems. And so, <coughs> and so one big difference then between this view and, and Barry's is that it's uh, no longer a kind of single system. Right. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, that's <coughs> But for you, the relationship between these different many systems is presumably not at all symmetric. Yeah, so <clears throat> there's uh, a sense in which they're symmetric and a sense in which it's not. So I think that uh, there's still supervenience holds. So, you know, uh, rabbits really are composed of particles and fields or, or whatever. Um, but there, there is a kind of symmetry, though, in terms of uh, projectability. So it's a kind of projectability non-reductionism. So the judgment, oh, thank you so much, David. Sure. Uh, yeah, so there's this kind of projectability non-reductionism. So each of the individuals, where, where we could actually talk about the same object in the, in, from the view of, diff, from the perspective of different uh, uh, theories, um, in those cases, you know, there will be supervenience, uh, but what, what are the projectable generalizations? Uh, there's no, uh, it's not built in that one is right on this view. You could get cases of conflict, which is one of the the downsides of this view. Yeah. Just going back to the primitive vocabulary for a minute, can you say a little bit more about, in general, why you think there couldn't be a story about how these things were discovered? Um, well, there might be some story, but it would be a, I think it would be a, the same kind of story that the Lewisian typically thinks that are stronging when they try to give such a story can't give. Uh, so I think it would fall. I think it won't be different, you know, so when Armstrongian says uh, that the uh, practice of science, uh, you know, is uh, picking out that some of these things have their little necessity symbol in, in front of them, um, I suppose the Lewisian could give something similar like that, but I don't think, I don't see why the practice of science would actually I mean, it could all just go horribly wrong. You could have just chosen the wrong vo uh, vocabulary. I think it's sort of a challenge there. I mean, there seems to be a, a similar concern which arises under the sort of projective that's been looking at. Um, which is, yeah, I mean, surely you have to sort of input some predicates in and some standards and get out and see the for that. But science was sort of radically wrong in sort of inputting the wrong predicates, as it were. So we still have some kind of story, I presume, about sort of why does we think we've gone on to kind of... Oh no, but on this view, you can't, you can't choose the wrong predicates. That doesn't make sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, it's sort of, it's very helpful. I'm, I'm getting the idea on your view. You're not thinking that there is a fundamental vocabulary. We have is these different sciences, which are each looking at their individual, the vocabulary of their domain. So physics might be looking at like the motions of bodies. So its vocabulary is going to be about body motion. Economics might be looking at market systems. So its mm -hmm. vocabulary is going to be about markets. There's not really an issue about whether any of these vocabularies is fundamental for the world full stop. It's just that each of them is the particular, the domain that best describes, sorry, the vocabulary that best that's, describes the domain of the science. That's the problem. I mean, the sort of best there was where I have an issue. But it's not an issue about whether there can be different levels. Because I don't think even someone like, Lewis and Ben Bay could be okay with. Um, but we do have this idea that if we're going around describing economic systems, 
there are sort of better and worse ways of treating vocabularies to do that. I mean, is that something you accept? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's one of the, the yeah. So that's one of the the less savory aspects of this view uh, is that yeah, there's not really a yeah. So the answer to that is there's not there isn't really a better or worse way of uh, picking the vocabulary because that is then to ask for some sort of transcendent. Uh, optimization metric over a bunch of different systems, which is in this side, and the, the idea here is just to relativize so I don't have to do that. But that's life, I think. Uh, that that's, you know, we don't know uh, which one is the right one. I mean, we, we, we do make these judgments, obviously, but there's not a, a it's kind of a Carnapian type of picture. Uh, that's fine, but I mean, kind of, there are standards within that picture, I take. I mean... Yeah, those, but those are all pragmatic, you know, why did I pick one framework rather than another? You know, there's pragmatic... I mean, pragmatic sounds yeah. fine, though. I mean, so I, I'm not sort of arguing for there being a kind of, sort of transcendent standard you can pick out mm -hmm. of the necessarily. Um, but you could imagine having sort of internalist and pragmatic standards, which you talk about sort of um, trying to put vocabularies out, different laws out, and seeing how they go. Mm -hmm. And the thought is, you want to say sort of something like this to make it seem plausible that a relativist law would be sort of enough to get you kind of the sort of stuff that happens. Oh, yeah, I definitely really want to say that. I mean, that, that's really in a way the whole idea. So, you know, another way to put the motivation in the picture is, you know, so Lewis talks about he says, well, you know, why isn't, uh, you know, why isn't this the law of nature? Uh, so for all x, f of x, yeah, uh, where f is a predicate that applies to all and only the things that exist in the actual world. Uh, so this big, so f is presumably really hard to get a grasp on for, for human beings. And so he so he tried to say, you know, so it's simple, so it's maximally strong and about as simple as you're going to get. Why isn't this a law of nature? And his answer is because f is the wrong, the wrong predicate. You know, so it's the wrong, it's not grabbing on the natural kinds of the world. Our answer is, we don't care about F. Uh, we can't handle F. Our brains would blow up if we really you know, understood F or something like that. Uh, so, 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 for, yeah. pra so pragmatic interest then come in and say, you know, forget this one. We, we wanted the one with, about masses and charges or something. So the thought is, why can't the Lewisian say all that? I mean, a lot of the... I believe the sort of isn't happy about this, but a lot of it seems kind of pragmatic. We want simple things, we want the strong things. Or not. Why not think you can give a similar kind of argument for picking out the primitive kinds? But there'll be kind of pragmatic criteria about sort of the sort of systems that humans are and the kind of endeavors they have in the world and what kind of things they can get yeah. out of their heads. Uh, yeah, I, I do want to do that. Uh, why can't the Lewisian? Oh, why can't the Lewisian? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, they can, but why, why then think that? Uh, you know, that, that that result is uh, actually getting the, the privileged natural kinds. I mean, I presume that there's a story about the privileged natural kinds kind of, they play various sort of theoretical roles, they're sort of underpinning lots of things. I presume a story could fall out out of that. I mean, if they're playing all, if there's sort of foundation for those pragmatic things we do, like picking out stuff in roles and kind of factuals and whatnot, um, by doing the kind of things that the privileged stuff is involved with, um, we'd have access to it. Yeah, that's the story I would like to hear, and if I heard it and believed it, then I, maybe I would change my mind, I don't know. But that's why I'm kind of skeptical. How does he know there is no F? Sorry? How does he know there is no F? That's satisfying. For all that stuff. Well, he's assuming that there is, so he's just defined F such that it holds of that it in this world. F just is the predicate that, uh, uh, that attaches to all things that, if it only if they, they exist in the actual world. Uh, thanks, so, there's no... so if you knew, I mean, so it's like, you know, it's, all, it's also, it, it'd be like, you know, being told, you know, if you were in a classical world, you know, what the exact uh, point in phase space is. So if you're told that, then you could, you know, reproduce exactly what all the future and all the past. Uh, but that predicate is so complicated and miserable, we can't handle it. Uh, we're not interested in it.
this is saying like any case of conflict between the device based systems, but so on the on the traditional bell system view, uh, law of nature has to be true, right? It's hard to square that with the possibility of conflict. So are you relaxing that requirement? To uh, you know, uh, uh, like proof like that, rather than proof like that? I'm tempted to. Uh, but uh, you know, in the in the in the in the, in the uh, I don't know in the official views in the paper, we, we don't. Uh, we do think, you know, that it's consistent. I mean, so that that, that is, you know, so where the conflict is, it will be something like, you know, what kind of factuals? So I suppose I make some kind of factual from. So Sally, uh, I mean, we kind of like this aspect in some ways. So there's, you know, so physics Sally, and then there's uh, you know, biology Sally. And she comes up with, she does her weighting of things with her function. And spits out some laws. And the, and these laws, so we like the effect that there's this kind of autonomy uh, to, uh, to bi the laws of biology. You know, why should what she, why should the standards the, and the optimization of virtues in biology yield the same things as what, what, what happens in physics? Uh, we don't see any reason, uh, and we think that when people talk about the autonomy of the sciences, this is a good way of cashing that out. But it will have the result, though, that what, what laws there are, and therefore what kind of actuals are true, uh, could conflict with here, or if we think of chance in the kind of Lewisian picture, it might be that the, you even get a conflict with the chances. Yes, yeah, I, I can see why there could be a conflict. Uh, like uh, chance levels, but it's harder to imagine cases of uh, non-chance. Uh, well, think of uh, you know well. Just a good way to think about. It. I mean, suppose I come up with the best system in terms of gru and gleam instead of uh, green and blue, you know, then what kind of factuals, what I should expect the next emerald I look at, uh, what I should expect would it be different on, based on the best systems for the two. So then there would be con a conflict. So what I, what, what, what's projectable would then be different. Right, okay, but then you, you, you're getting rid of the truth requirement. One of the, they can be Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that's why I uh, uh, yeah. So to do the oh yeah. So I shouldn't have done the grew and glean one. Uh, yeah. Let's then think more in terms of the chances. You know, where I could get the uh, where where biology spits out or say ecology spits out some some claim about the chances of there being a certain number of rabbit offspring in some field at some point. Physics spits out another one, and they conflict. Uh, yeah, so th then it's actually kind of hard to actually get a conflict case, but you know, what, uh, but once you, but you can, and then once you do, uh, what do you say? Well, then I think th then just say that's a that's th th those are the hard facts of life uh, that you know we don't know which one automatically to trust. Uh, it could be that the special science is better. It could be that the other one is better. Um, but it, it seems to me like if you're, if you're a union about chance, then cases of conflict between two chance signals are going to be, they're going to be fairly limited, right? I mean, you know, one could say the outcome of this uh, chance trial has a 0.5 chance of happening, and the other might say 1.49, but there can be a huge divergence uh, between the two, right? So the, the conflicts are going to be. That's right. Uh, yeah, so the, that should be built in that the, hopefully you won't get too many big conflicts. And also, I mean, it's, to actually even say that you're specifying the same event in the two different vocabularies is going to be very tricky. Right. You know, so, uh, you know, of course we know, you know, the probability of, uh, you know, success if I get a knee operation given that I'm a, you know, white male is different than the probability of success that I'm a white male over 40. Uh, you know, so if I, you know, specify the event in different ways, that, that kind of conflict is no problem. Going back to the question of whether or not you can know if you have the optimal vocabulary, there's a little bit of information there that says that you can't. So the, the, the small drop complexity of some description is, is given by the length of the shortest program you can output that description. And it's, it's generally uncomputable for you to be able to find out if you like, in fact have the optimal, shortest, most concise description. But you can certainly compare two descriptions and say one is more concise than the other. 
wouldn't say one's better than the other, but for whether or not you have the best system of blogs and, and the best descriptions. I think that's, that's generally unknowable. Yeah, so if you want to think about this from that point of view, think of, you know, Sally is computing in part the, what she's doing, the computing that function f, she's in part computing the order of complexity, if you like, uh, but, but that's famously, you know, language dependent, and so then, you know, this one is coming up with one with one language, this one's coming up with another with another language. But, but they're always offset uh, by a constant number of sets in, in any two languages. So that, uh, I, I don't think that's a fundamental problem. It's actually back on to Mal's point. And I thought you could have conflicting counterfactuals. I mean, the, the client for truth was just about the actual events, I think. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. So right. sort of the blue green, the blue green down to the same end. But yeah, but the thing is, I think the problem with that one is that, you know, so there are certain, you know, let's suppose you have all of world history and a certain number of observations, and then that next emerald. Yeah, I, need to, uh, I need to make it so that the, both of those systems are. Uh, yeah, empirically adequate. I mean, they're adequate, uh, not so empirically adequate, but adequate to the, to the set of events that actually have. But they will still have some place in their counterfactuals. Yeah. I'm sorry, I thought, uh, this is also on Tamal's point, I thought that Tamal was pointing out that we take the generalizations of like psychology to be strictly speaking false. Uh, you know, like they oh. have some exceptions, uh, or they're statistical in some way. But the way we get around that is either by saying, well, yeah, we have a Ketteris Paribus clause in front of them, or by saying they're false, but they're useful in application to a wider but yeah, no, I'm, I'm imagining there is this kind of egalitarianism that they're all okay. And what's going to be the case, and this is then connect up, you'll see in a second to uh, all this past hypothesis stuff, is that you know, what might be the case is that some generalization in psychology or biology might be projectable, might have the, you know, human necessity to it. But from the point of view of uh, physics, it would be true, but it would be an accident. Or vice versa. You know, so if you think about it, uh, you know, so, you know, Fodor says, uh, you know, asks, uh, talks about the conspiracy of the special sciences. And so he says, you know, Suppose you've got this generalization in ecology, you know, a really robust, reliable generalization in ecology about the number of offspring, uh, you know, being produced in some field or something. Well, how do all those little rabbits, I mean, how do all the part, you know, those particles, I mean, the, 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 those rabbits are composed of fur and stuff, and the fur is composed of particles. How do, how do all those, you know, protons and electrons know to execute their behavior such that it makes ecology look good and come out true? You know, how do they know? And so it's a massive conspiracy then among all the particles to make the ecology look good. Same kind of thing with thermodynamics, you know, so, how, so that's the question we are dealing with really in the thermodynamic case. How do all those little particles know to execute their behavior in such a way so that it makes uh, thermodynamics come out right? So what might be, uh, so it looks like a conspiracy, and on this kind of egalitarianism, uh, we note that you've got conspiracy all, all over the place. Uh, so we don't get rid of the conspiracy, but we just sort of make it more palatable because it's everywhere. Because, you know, from the point of view of ecology, is, uh, you know, you might look and say, you know, why do all the bunnies, why do they always fall? You know, uh, so, you know, what, it's a conspiracy. What, you know, what makes all those bunnies always fall? Gravity. Uh, and so, uh, from each perspective, so you have all these different, so you've got the, you know, the stuff, the world, and then you've got all these different theories, you know, looking at it, uh, you know, and uh, so you, you know, they each have their own laws, and they might conflict in some way. Okay, enough about that. Let's. Uh, you, I'm going to move on to the past hypothesis. <laughs> I just want to understand something. Um, on your, on your view. Could you also have a cosmology Sally and a rather different elementary particle physics Sally? Mm -hmm. So that you wouldn't be quite as concerned as um, a non human would be about co conflicts between cosmology and elementary particle physics. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think you'd have these sort of pragmatic uh, reasons for wanting to, you know. Have fewer systems. So this whole thing would apply to f even within physics, and yeah, not yeah, just yeah. between different sciences. And uh, at least at first glance, I kind of like this aspect because when, actually, when you do look at the different sciences, or even the you know, it, you know, how you 
carve up the domain of knowledge into sciences. I don't you know, there's no fixed way to do this, but um, you know, it does look like in some theories, you know, what what function Stanley is calculating it might be different. So that is maybe in cosmology, theoretical virtues weigh more than empirical virtues. Maybe in some other areas, empirical virtues weigh more. Uh, why think that there's sort of one set, uh, you know, given uh, way of mag uh, optimization of virtues? Uh, I think Tim and then David. So can you just, I'm just curious, can you just say you, you invoked an interesting principle of gastronomy that I don't understand? Of who? Gastronomy. Gastronomy? Yeah, the principle was you make X more palatable by making more of it. You just said, well, there are these conflicts, you might worry about those. I'm going to make it more palatable by making more of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, yeah, yeah. I don't so think that's the astronomy at all. <laughs> I, I don't think I can actually make my food better just by making more of it if it's bad. So what, uh, what's, you're the, at the table, what's the thought yeah, so behind that? You're at the yeah you're at the I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're you're at the table and you know you 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 uh, once again you've ordered you know what you you know <laughs> you're, you're at, you know my wife always orders something better than I do at the restaurant you know every time you know, I, I I look at my what I order and what she ordered is better it'd be better though if she what she ordered didn't taste good too <laughs> but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I, no, no, no. That, that is, it, it, if, it's, if you see that it's endemic, that the kind of conspiracy is endemic, so it's just sort of built in to this kind of. Once I free myself of a single bad, system, and you think you're making things worse and worse, not better and better. Yeah, you just see it's part of the. It, you see it's part of the, the scientific enterprise, uh, and so it's it's just there, and you. And it's not something special about. Uh, you know, how do those bunny, how do the particles and the bunnies know to execute this conspiracy? Uh, if you see that just, you know, the conspiracy is just, there aren't, I mean, here, here's the thing. Yeah, so, you know, in that, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, the throwaway uh, you know, musical acts, they, they made a line where they said, if everybody's somebody, then nobody's anybody. That's the thinking here. So if I, you know, so if, if everybody, if everything's conspiratorial, then nothing's conspiratorial. So it's not really conspiratorial. That that statement is just a self contradiction. Nah, I know that you be newer and say therefore it's deep, but it's just a self contradiction. If everything's a, if everybody's everything's a conspiracy, then everything's a conspiracy. And if you don't like conspiracy, you make things worse. Not better. I, I don't see it that way. I think if it, if you see it as kind of built in to, to this way of you know once I once I uh, go for a multi a multi uh, best system view, it's just kind of built in that there's going to be once I go to this kind of projectability uh, relativism, it's just going to be built in. All right now. I, I really put my foot in my mouth these more hands. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to, this is probably along similar lines to Shelley's question and to, and to Tim's question. But I, presumably there's a, a, well, I don't know. Is it the case that there's some kind of a limit to this liberality? That is, if I see, if I see, I, I, Presumably, there are instances in science where, I don't know, you're looking at some system that, that properly falls under the domain of biology, um, but, but you're looking at it at a certain level of detail, and you see explicit violations of what you take to be, the, say, the conservation of energy, or, or some law of physics, or something like that. Presumably, you do conclude in those cases, oh, this has implications about physics. Something's wrong with the conservation of energy. Is that not the case? Um, what are you concluding? You're concluding that the biology is wrong? No, you're concluding, concluding that, that the, the physics is wrong, I think. Um, well, yeah, but you, could, but, 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 but you, but you in, could translate in the midst all of biological activity. You know, but the, presumably the you could associated with biological science. Presumably you could translate those that data into the vocabulary of physics, and then it would just be. A, but I don't a, understand. A if, I can always, if I can always do that, then um, 
Good. There must be something about the, the whole view here that I'm that I'm not completely understanding. Um, if you can always translate that into, if you can always translate everything into the language of physics, um, um, why isn't that the first step towards megalomania? Um, isn't that reduction? Yes, so, yes, so th this is, uh, so it, it's holding, you know, uh, supervenience, right. but, it, but it has this, uh, but, you know, the little end bo box or, you know, the necessity is, is uh, not being used. <coughs> right. So I can translate everything in, uh, into the lower levels, but what, but, but what I don't do is then think that I also translate the necessity box into the lower level. Um, so there's some things that would be necessary on one level and won't be necessary, will be contingent on the other level, or vice versa. But can there be anything necessary on one level and false on the other level? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. That is that's what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to... Uh, I want to make sure I understand the conspiracy idea. So... When we talk about conspiracy, we don't uh, include physics, laws of physics in the conspiracy, right? We don't ask, when I say why all these uh, electrons behave such that ecology works, we, okay, that's a conspiracy, but what about why do electrons obey the Schrodinger's equation? Is that also part of conspiracy? Because if it is, then the question becomes why are there laws of nature? Yeah, so that's not a conspiracy on this kind of view because you know I, I invented the Schrodinger equation to summarize those behaviors. Um, so so I don't ask you know why why the why those particles obey the Schrodinger equation. If they didn't obey the Schrodinger equation, I wouldn't have come up with the Schrodinger equation. When electrons obey the Schrodinger equation, then the rest follows. Why can't you say? I know I understand what's going on. It's just the Schrodinger equation is manifesting. Uh, yeah. So, but it, yeah. But the the Schrodinger equation isn't implying the laws of ecology. Well, we Only those the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation plus like initial conditions, conditions are. And that's why it's coming out as contingent and seeming to be conspiratorial. I mean, what, is it a metaphysical impossibility that in the future we won't figure out how to get ecology? Schrodinger equation. You might be able to do it, but the, the idea is you won't be able to, it's, it, it's not built in that it's going to come out as the laws of, uh, uh, so you're going to get ecology, you're going to get all those rabbits in the right places at the right times, but whether it's necessary, you know, whether, you, whether it comes out as necessary from the point of view of physics, that if, you know, so you could imagine worlds where you call it, you know, that have obeyed the Schrodinger equation where ecology is not right. Uh, and so this is a way of trying to spell that out so that you don't have to say that it's going to necessarily get, you know, imply the laws of ecology. Uh, David? Yeah. Just, just saying about the papers, so, I mean, and this guess is your best guess. I, I mean, uh, what we've sort of seen if you get us that there is um, highly plausible reasons to suspect that the the laws of microphysics alone are not going to logically entail a whole lot of the macro, uh, the macro equations. So the strategy that David was playing with, that you're, you're kind of moving against here, would be to say, okay, well, what, what other hypothesis couched in the kind of language of physics could be made that will cause that choice entailment? And the way I'm thinking of saying, see, this is like I've got, I've got a bunch of other laws, and they're, you know, they're not inconsistent. I mean, I suppose one way of thinking is that they all imply various constraints on the, on, on, on the, you know, what, what we do, I don't feel like categorically what the, what, what the kind of state is, or probabilistically the kind of state, but in any case, constraints whose best way of characterising them is simply in terms of saying, well, all these higher levels are not. And so that's the, that's the kind of way in which they can be consistent. Yeah, yeah. But, but then, okay, so, so I'd say that was logical, and then what, what worries me is, is that, that that would seem to be quite healthy, descriptable world in which we just didn't have any luck. In, in the project of deriving high-level laws from laws of physics plus physics-level assumptions. But 
one of the things we did in that sat neck, we would have done in that sat neck course you mentioned at the beginning, would be things like calculate diffusion coefficients um, and phase transition, critical exponents, and all that kind of stuff. And so it, it does seem the project, this is way, way, way from your point, the project had actually seen to do those derivations does seem to have a, a number of rather notable successes. And if we can't derive it just from the law alone, we do seem to be in the business of deriving it from the laws and from some kind of admittedly shaky and not entirely clear assumption that we're making in the vocabulary of microphysics. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, this is one of the areas where I, in which I find the view less uh, you know, attractive. Uh, so, you know, the way you have to think about what's going on there. So, so you what might think, well, what are you doing? Maybe we could use this as a way of segueing into the actual step next stuff. But uh, what are you doing when you're doing these kind of reductions that you see in statistical mechanics? So when you actually are able to, you know, I mean, it's beautiful, you know, even, you know, forget statistical mechanics, just think of kinetic theory, when you are able to derive the ideal gas law, it's beautiful, right? And so what are you doing there? Well, then you're, you know, you've got one, one, one science and another science, and now you've got another one, which is, you know, using a different vocabulary, you know, joining the two together. Uh, <clears throat> and then that sort of makes you think that maybe you, if you could do that all the time, then, then, then you could carry out the uh, project that, uh, then you would, then, then, you know, then you're, you're sort of marching toward imperialism, right? So, so, or, you know, suppose if we took biology, you know, you could do uh, experiments in natural selection, you know, of bacteria, and you could just run these things really quickly, lots of bacteria, and, and suppose it turned out that the probability, you know, that you, the probabilities of certain types of bacteria evolving turned out to be such that you could actually, you know, reduce it to the, st the static probabilities. Well, that would really... That would be awesome, right? And then that would be sort of evidence that David's view is is right. Uh, but since you can't do anything like that, I'm trying to sketch a view where it, yeah. of the world where you can at least make sense of what's going on if if that if you can't do that. No, I see that. I mean, I, then what's interesting is on that view, how do we make sense of those transitions we have not? Yeah, just as some sort of third right. system. Okay. Uh, at some point, I don't know when, uh, I don't want to be rude, but at some point I want to get to what I want to talk about today, but uh, we're already uh, like an hour in. But let's, yeah, uh, I'll try to handle it quickly on it. Uh, yeah, I'm making what I think is going to be a quick turning point. So, let's see. Uh, I think that the cons what you're saying is, look, the, cons the feeling of conspiracy comes from the idea that the lower level physics has got to somehow make true these higher level laws, right? And then it looks like whatever the particles would have to do in order to get from the lower level physics to these biological generalizations is really conspiratorial. You're trying to sketch a few laws on which there's no uh, reason to think that the lower level physics is making true the higher level generalizations. You just have all these true generalizations. And depending on what domain you're in, you capture different ones of them as laws, but there doesn't need to be any making true relation between the different sciences. And in that case, there's no reason to think that there's a conspiracy from one perspective of one science to make the other science true. It's just that you've got tons of generalizations in the world, and some of them are classified in one science and some are classified in another, and that's all there is to it. It's not like... Yeah, so I mean, that's the way I think about it. So I think once you well. see that there's all these different sallies, I think, well, what else would you expect? Yeah. That, that, you know, that because all, if all what's projectable in all these different for all these different sallies are designed to mesh, then you know, this is what you expect. I just have to check. I'm not exactly clear on how the conspiracy shows up in the different levels. So say we're doing some biology. If part of the sort of funny behavior we're observing is sort of bunnies falling over and bunnies not leaving the earth and things like this, why is it that in order to sort of explain or to provide information about those occurrences, we don't end up introducing sort of gravitational constants and things like that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, if each, uh, each Sally is charged with a certain, is interested in a certain domain uh, of uh, phenomena, so the 
So in a way that the, the mosaic that they're interested in, they don't see. Well, that's the thing. They don't see the other stuff that's sort of beyond their yeah. interest. Yeah. It's hard to see why it's going to sort of show up as a... Yeah, it doesn't, it, in there, from their point of view, it, it doesn't show up as a conspiracy. Okay. It's only sort of stepping outside that we see that it's conspiratorial. But then that's the way it is with the physical one, too. I mean, then I sort of don't see the problem anymore. I mean, because I... Well, then that's good. Because, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, last one, then we're going to move on. Uh, I, would, I would strongly argue that you should not expect to be able to derive, let's say, biology from fundamental physics. And I think it comes down to a straightforward uncomputability. Even if the laws of physics are deterministic, uh, uncomputability applies especially to deterministic systems. So I don't think it's a surprise at all that one level isn't necessarily derivable from the other, and that you don't have that error of necessity. Um, well, that's true, but uh, you know, when we're in this kind of, you know, uh, kind of crazy metaphysical game we're playing, you know, you, Sally can, Sally can compute these things. I mean, the, 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 the ideal one. You're allowing Sally yeah, to compute yeah. computable things. Well, no, but uh, you know, Sally can just uh, uh, not not my Sally, but, but uh, David Sally. Uh, could do some kind of uh, well. I mean, we don't have to think of her actually as you know actually computing, right? She could just spit out uh, things just which are true. Right? Right? She just know if you are from the onset. Yeah, uh, she could just know, you know. Yeah, given. I mean, she, so just like she could spit out for all x f of x, uh, she could just spit out whatever whatever it is that holds of all the things in the mosaic. Okay, let me. Uh, move on to just quickly applying this view, and then I want to turn to something completely different. Okay, so the so here's here's the kind of special science uh, alternative. So you can think of this as a kind of uh, think of just think of stat mech as another special science. Now you've got a new predicate. You know, this chance that, that uh, StatMec uses. You think of all these different systems, you know, so you've got the coffee cup and you put the uh, certain uh, probability measure over it. Uh, I think in some paper I call it SP standard. I don't even know what I call it. What SP is, but... Uh, statistical postulate. Statistical postulate, yes. Uh, and, you know, so I've got other coffee cups, all these different coffee cups, and I put the, you know, put this uh, st uh, statistical postulate on all of those things. On uh, David's sort of view, you know, what you have is, you know, what you're really doing is you've got this statistical postulate over the initial conditions, you're conditionalizing on the, on the macro, you're conditionalizing on that with respect to the uh, information you have at the macro state, instead of making a minor change to the statistical postulate uh, that you're using when you're putting it down on the on, on coffee cups and whatnot, uh, but you know, with regard to, to the future direction, it's going to be roughly the same. Uh, with regard to the past, it's going to be nice because then you're going to get you know Napoleon's boots and all of that stuff. On the on the on the uh, on the special science view, you you're you know erasing all of this. You're saying uh, you're saying think of it like a special science. So if you think of evolutionary biology. You, know, you think there's all these different things that are life. Uh, evolutionary biology, it's like, like STATMIC, it, it has these kind of static conditional probabilities, it's got dynamic uh, transition probabilities, you've got this uh, you know, big uh, articulated theory of uh, with a probabilistic apparatus. What does it apply to? Well, it applies to you know, living creatures. What are living creatures? Well, there are different views on this. You know, you might, one view might be that there are things with mouths and arms, but then that's not a very good view. Uh, you could say, you know, the way uh, uh, some biologists think about it, what living creatures are, are those things which obey the laws of evolutionary biology. So you define it, you know, life in, implicitly in terms of those things that are, uh, are characterized by that probabilistic apparatus. And so, you don't then, 
uh, you know, so what what the thing is is just so it, you know what what things are living just it are those things that such that the that probabilistic apparatus uh, works for. And you can imagine a similar view here, uh, where I then you know erase all of this. And just say, and I just cheat now. So if I'm cheating with respect to the previous, you know, with respect to the way David is thinking about it and the way I used to think about it. This is just manifestly cheating. Because now you want to ask, you know, the natural question to ask is, you know, when you start thinking about the reversibility objection, you start thinking about, well, I could backward time evolve this probability distribution, and then what? You know, so I've got my coffee cup, but I can backward time evolve it into some, you know, big messy state. Uh, just because it's messy and not characterized by the English word coffee cup, I could I can still backward time evolve that thing. But at those points, it's just not a something that will where, where it will work, and so I don't. Um, and so I think of it the same way as I do here with life, and you know this is uh, what seems. So what what's wrong with this view? Well. To me, there seems to be a couple of things that are seem kind of uh, uh, unsavory. What, uh, but, but I think if you know, if you try and articulate uh, an alternative to Davis, then I think that it's more or less inevitable. Uh, you might think. I think the way Horwich thinks about it is this: you know, that well, you have what you know. The reason to posit this big one here is a kind of common cause explanation. For all these different isolated cases, where uh, you know, whenever I get a coffee cup, it turns out that I can I can use the statistical postulate and it works well. And then over here too, and over here too, and over here too. Well, why? Uh, answer here. Uh, it's uh, but uh, if you think about it from the point of view of you know life, you don't think that necessarily you know. So why is it that evolutionary biology works for all these different systems? Uh, is there is there really a common cause for all of this? No, it just it just does. And it's not like so. You, if, and I, I want to make one point here, which is that just like in you know, it's not a complete explanatory kind of nihilism, because you can of course explain why there's life, but you don't need to explain it with regard to the. But in your explanation of why there's life, so like in origins of life research. It doesn't have to be the case that the probabilities you use are the probabilities that you use in evolutionary biology. Similarly, when you move here, you might explain, you know, the, you know, why the, how that coffee cup arose, and there might be all sorts of ways of explaining this. But you don't explain. There's no necessary, you know, thing forcing you to explain it with regard to the chances that you used in the in the special science. And so there's this move where it says where uh, the imperialist is saying that you have to explain the uh, origin of these things in terms of the chances that are found in the, in the, in the special science itself. And on uh, this view, that's not the case. These will turn out to be, from a certain point of view, just contingent, accidental. Why were there all these coffee cups, and why does it work that there are all these coffee cups such that I can get use the slap the statistical postulate on it and then you know, get back some some successful science, but I had that sort of problem over here anyway. Okay, so that's the picture. Does it bother you that this might seem to involve a possibly unhealthy suppression of scientific curiosity? <laughs> uh, I, I, that, that's what I was. That's why I was just saying this about you know like with the origins of life to try to. Push against that. So you could be curious, but there is but, still but, you but, are but suppressing. On the imperialist view, you're, you're getting your, hand, your arms are tied. You know, the, the curiosity has to be such that you know the explanation of these only comes from. No, no, no. The, I don't. The, the no, 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 not the only there. comes from. No, no. You do have. A, there is a certain, what, which I think all of us here would agree is a certain kind of puzzling situation. How the constituents of the coffee cup are behaving is governed by reversible laws. So one might be curious about why you should have irreversible laws. And you know, when they're you know, 
It's just a question of one wishes to address that question one way or another and to say, oh, I don't really care about that question. But you, uh, caring about such questions often leads to great progress in science. Uh, yeah, uh, it's true. Uh, and, you know, it could turn out that this imperialist picture is, is right. Uh, but can you imagine a world where it's not? Would it make sense for there to be a world where it's not? I'm trying to sketch up. No, of course it could uh, be a yeah. world where it's not. Uh, but, I mean, the, the, but one should not... That, so that, that is, of course, a possibility, right. But one should probably not start out with any standpoint of suppression of curiosity. One should explore all the alternatives and see what's most reasonable. No, right. Sure. But he's not, I'm not he's saying not, this. He, yeah. He's not in the business here of prescribing, you know, he's, 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 he's not in the business of making prescriptions for scientists. He's trying to imagine a certain kind of, he's trying to ask how one ought to describe a world in which, as a matter of fact, the imperialist project fails. Yeah, so, for, yeah, so I'm, I'm so I think with David's thing is like a bold, you know, a bold conjecture. Here's the explanation for why all these different things, uh, where the, why, I mean, it's amazing, how, you know, I can, you know, whenever things turn to coffee cups, I can slap the statistical postulate on them and, you know, get things going right in, the, in, in one direction and not the other. Uh, here's, a, here's a bold conjecture as to why that's so. I'm saying, it might be that that bold conjecture is wrong, you could still then come up with explanations, you know, but they'd be more, they wouldn't necessarily be with that same probability measure for why, why uh, these systems evolve and, uh, you know, come about, but it just won't be using the same exact probability measure as the ones that operate at that level. I'm not sure the significance of why it has to be the same probability measure. So I can, I can imagine an imperialist project we want to explain why this is a possible work so well for these things. But in fact, it required um, positing some other different kind of distribution at the starting point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would still seem to be equally imperialist. It just seems to sort of be kind of convenient and nice that it worked out this way, but it's the same each time. Right, right. That's right. So, you know, you could imagine different types of imperialism where uh, instead of using the standard uh, uh, statistical postulate, they used something else, and it then implied that I'm going to find all these coffee cups. And I mean, I never tell a story about why why the statistical postulate then worked in those cases. Yeah. I, I guess so. So I might agree with your argument that says there should be no requirement maybe the same thing each time, but not take that as a reason to get rid of that explanatory box altogether, which is what we seem to have done here to the right side. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, yeah. So there's a variety of views. Then. Okay, let me uh, see. Let, let's move on to a completely different topic. I'm sorry that took so long. Uh, okay. Suppose I'm wrong about all of that. Okay, so I'm completely wrong. There is a past hypothesis. Then, do, do we have to explain it? So many physicists and philosophers said, you know, it's one of the great projects of uh, science, the great open questions of science is explaining the past hypothesis, okay, uh, or let's say the state that is the past, the state that the past hypothesis implies the past state, uh, is this so? Well, let's try to think about explanation a little bit and think about, uh, just try to marshal intuitions a little bit about, about different things, okay? So let's take some different cases. We'll go all the way to cosmology and different cases and try to think, think through some of them. Uh, this is more the free, free voting part of the, the lecture. Uh, so in 1994, in Fletcher, 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 England, the following thing happened. Get their names. Hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right Two ladies, twins, named Lorraine and Lavinia, were driving uh, in uh, oh, yeah, Fletcham, England. 
They were driving to give it, to exchange Christmas presents. They were driving, and they got into a head-on collision. These two ladies. Their names uh, they were, were Christmas, and this happened on Christmas Eve. And so you've got these twins named Christmas, Lavinia and, uh, and Lorraine Christmas, on Christmas Eve, two, dro two, two exchange Christmas presents, get into a car crash. What are the chances of that? This is really, 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 really unlikely. Uh, so you've got these Christmas twins. <laughs> What are the chances? It's just, you know, I mean, you know, uh, how many times has this ever happened? You know, uh, that, you know, do, you know, that you can imagine maybe a world where now this happens all the time. So the Halloween brothers on Halloween to exchange candy get into a car crash. And all this, all other sorts of worlds where this kind of thing happens. But it seems like this one you just chalk up and think, well, it's a little weird, but it's accidental. Uh, now think about, uh, uh, let's think about basketball. Let's think about the Los Angeles Lakers. I believe they had a, a three-peat, right? Didn't they? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, the Los Angeles Lakers uh, three-peat. They, the, they won the championship three times in a row. This was very unlikely because they sucked. <laughs> they were a horrible basketball team, playing the worst of basketball I've ever seen. The most selfish, horrible basketball you could ever hope for. Uh, and, but yet they win and beat all these superior teams. Uh, you know, and you think, well, what are the chances? Three times in a row, the, La the Lakers, despite sucking, end up winning. So here you might say, well, and you, and, you know, if, if you really hate the Lakers like I do, uh, if you hate the Lakers even more than you love your own team, uh, then you uh, think, well, it's really unfortunate that I live in a world where this unlucky thing happened. Uh, and so, but you might, chalk, you might chalk, chalk it up to chance. It's just coincidence, it just happened. You know, so just like the uh, Lavinia and uh, Lorraine uh, Christmas uh, twins, you know, it's just that, well, it just turned out that they, you know, there were many initial conditions for the universe. One of them had to be such that the Christmas twins on Christmas Day exchanging Christmas presents get into a car crash. And many others, presumably most, uh, don't have that. Might be that way with the Lakers. On the other hand, you know, depending, because you think they have stinks, and because it happens so many times, you might also think of a dynamical explanation, which is that the, the refs, you know, had, there was a fix. Uh, they, that, that there was a conspiracy. Lots of people think that. Kobe Bryant shot 6 for 24 in his final three-peat game. Six for twenty-four and won the MVP. It was, it was disgraceful. You should see. I mean, <laughs> there are YouTube, uh, uh, there are YouTube videos about the conspiracy that will that will just you know turn your hair white if you just. Did you put up any of these videos? Well, that's her, that's her, that's irrelevant. <laughs> So, this is a case where 
is more than, you know, so here's a single instance. Here we've got now types of things that are co-varying, which then make it seem more conspiratorial. Anyway, uh, here you have, uh, here this, you know, we can let this go, it's just a, it's just a special initial condition. Here, you know, conspiracy uh, people like me might think it's, we can't let it go, it needs some kind of dynamical conspiratorial explanation, but other, most people will just let that go, just accept that we live in an un unfortunate world. Here, again, now we've got generalization, you know, so not just a one time or three times, but many, 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 many times. And still, we'll accept that this generalization is just accidental, you know, not think of it as uh, something that, had to, that follows from law. And now with the past hypothesis, you then have, so now forget everything I said before, so now we're accepting that the past hypothesis is needed uh, to explain all these coincidences, what would otherwise be coincidences, why are all these, why is the world, why are all these systems of eight dynamics? It seems like it's too much of a, it's too much of a coincidence, and so we then come up with a theory to explain away that coincidence. And that theory, you note, know, we've got a measure that we use, a probability measure, well-defined and in the, the classical case, it's well defined. Uh, it's used in science. Yeah, so it's part of a, the foundations of an actual science. Um, it's natural in certain senses. Um, and empirically justified. And so we see all these different thermodynamic systems again and again. And we can use that statistical posture and again and again and again. And so we've got some, some empirical justification for it. We also have some empirical justification for other ones. You know, when we think of the discussion between David and Tim uh, from the day before. Uh, but, you know, for this one we do too. Yes? I just want to know what you meant by natural. As some people claim that it's actually a very unnatural thing. I think Sean Carroll says something like that about the least little linear state that it's. Oh, I'm just talking about the the, the, the measure itself. The measure. Okay. Which me say which measure? Uh, the big measure. measure. On oh. what? Hmm? On what? Oh, uh, yeah. So if we're in the classical domain, then. Do you mean the measure on the full space, not on the on the on the macro state? Not oh, on the oh, lowest yeah, yeah. macro state. That's the uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. So on, yeah. So on the particular macro macro state uh, that the past hypothesis is implying, that that measure. Yeah. So we well, we're restricting that measure now to that. No, but the the thing that's unlikely with respect to the probability measure on the big phase space is that macro state. So the yeah, yeah, yeah. the relevant measure is not the one on the macro state. Restricted oh. to the macro state, not the conditional measure. Well, yeah, so from that point of view, it's unlikely. Yeah, but then just, once which we, measure are you talking about there? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, I want to get to that because on the yeah, so the past hypothesis is often said. Well, I would get to this right now. Uh, so the question is, yeah, you know, do we have to explain the past hypothesis? Well, why would you have to explain the past hypothesis? Uh, one, I did, one, you know, I think the thought, the prop, the, I mean, there are very, there are various reasons why people, that, that people have thought that you have to. Probably the primary reason is that people think it's unlikely. And with respect to the measure on all, on, you know, the full space, it is. On the other hand, if you think of the, you know, if you think of the past hypothesis as a law, then it's probability one that that macro state was the, you know, uh, the macro state. And so that is not uh, something demanding. If, if, so if you thought it's unlikelihood with demanded explanation, then it's not really actually unlikely if you think of the past hypothesis as a law, because you've thrown out all those, all those possible worlds where the, where the past hypothesis isn't the case. And so, uh, so that's one reason then to think that you don't have to explain the past hypothesis, because that's a real conversation stopper when you say, well, why was there the past hypothesis? And the answer, because of the law. And then, that ends things. But even, even if it were unlikely, just because it's unlikely, I think, doesn't mean that it has to be explained. 
that uh, somehow you can just tell what should be the unexplained explainers in a theory versus what should be the, uh, the explained explainers in the theory. Uh, you know, uh, the dinosaurs, uh, what explained the, the, the extinction of the dinosaurs? It was that big meteor that hit the Yucatan. The, was the probability of the big, that big meteor hitting the Yucatan greater or less, less than the probability of the dinosaurs ex getting uh, extinct? It's probably less. So you could have a less likely thing explain a more likely thing. Sorry, I just want to get a clarification here. So uh, these qualities underneath past hypothesis, uh, it's used in science, it's natural, it's empirically, empirically justified. That all has to do with the probability measure that you're interested in? Or yeah. are these qualifications on the past hypothesis? Uh, yeah, so here, yeah, here I'm thinking about uh, that measure. Just the measure. Yeah, that probability measure. Okay. And my second question. Second question slash comment is, I, I know in some of your work, for example, the piece in the uh, BJPS and then in your dialogue piece with Price, you, you seem to be open to the idea that the past hypothesis could be explained. And you, you don't want to say, no, it's, it's rude, it has to be rude, there could be an explanation, right? And one of the sort of like the recommended pathways, possible pathways for explaining past hypothesis, I think in one of your pieces was something along the lines of, Hey, um, there could be this kind of retrodictive past uh, explanation sort of thing going on. So there could be some some state subsequent to the state described by the past hypothesis involving low entropy and the like, and this subsequent state could explain retrodictively this past low entropy condition. Right? Um, first, do I have that right? And second, is that the only kind of possible? Explanation of the past hypothesis that you would be open to. Um, yeah. So yes, you have that right. And uh, no, I, I think there'd be other things you could you could do. Um, but I'm just trying to uh, express a little bit of a little voice of skepticism that this is has to, that you have to that somehow science would be you know go, have gone badly wrong if you didn't come up with an explanation of the past right. hypothesis. Right. And yeah, so that's the next thing to then think about is then, you know, what would that be? What so, yeah, so you're going to come up with an ex explanation in some kind of cheesy sense of you know, given given the present state of the universe, like backward time evolved, and yeah. it then gets me that initial state. But uh, I don't know what we really call that an explanation. Now, some some people are going to say, I think this came out actually in your dialogue with with Sean that um, look, um, I don't need to say that the past hypothesis is extremely unlikely. I just need to say it's really unnatural, right? And and that's enough to sort of, you know, push me in the direction of proffering an explanation, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, you know, with that, uh, when 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 I say you know, voice a little bit of skepticism about whether this is one of the great unsolved problems of science, uh, it then puts me, makes me sound like some kind of you know, would be. Philosopher King, or, you know, are, uh, legislating to science what it should and shouldn't do. Scientists could do whatever they want, and there's plenty of reasons to maybe try to do something. If, if you find it unnatural, you find it ugly, you just don't like it. You've had a, a, a I don't know, a great cool idea or or whatever. Uh, and then you know when you come up with that, but but to think that you can sort of see before you've come up with that theory, what are the uh, what are the brute facts? What what should be brute and what shouldn't be brute, or what should be the explain? What, you know, that certain things can't be the unexplained explainers beforehand. You know, if you've come up with a theory, then we can look at that and compare the two and look at the virtues and, and vices. But knowing before the hand that this has to be the case, that because it, so, I, so it's perfectly okay, and you know, to come up with some alternative. Uh, but I, you know, maybe you don't think this is natural. But then I think you should just say that you know that doesn't have any kind of epistemic force. That claim. That, uh, that, that's the idea. Yeah. I'm trying to do that. So he, he, I think I was reading the logic. Um, sure, that there are lots of reasons to worry that talking about the past hypothesis being unlikely might not even make sense in some sense. But even if it is unlikely, we can shrug because at some point you just detect unlikely things as happening, and, and that's just the way that is. And I worry this is a qualitative comparison issue. I mean, if you buy the argument for unlikeness, the level of unlikeness is something like 10 to the power of 10 to the minus 10 to the power of 90. 
I mean, this isn't like the latest Winfrey games. This is like every time anyone jumps in the air, they, they, they're able to just fly around like Earth because it just so happens that all the molecules underneath them push them up. I mean, if, I mean, if you're willing to say, yeah, that's also something you could just say, that's just unlikely, but unlikely things happen, then sure. But I don't think your question is up, for example, to give you anything like that level of. Um, yeah, if you. Um, well, if you're thinking of the passive hypothesis of the law, then it's probability one. No, no, sure. I'm just saying, conditional on the idea that we say that, that we think it's unlikely. I mean, so one response is to say, well, if it's just not unlikely, you'll think that probability one. Right. Um, I, I, took, I took your point as being in part, in you are thinking Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, yeah. So if, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so suppose you didn't think of the past hypothesis <coughs> in the law, but just some kind of contingent early state. That's right. Then, then, then uh, and, and because that measure is you know used in science, natural, has empirical justification, then it really is bad because it really is then you know super un all these thermodynamic happenings are really really super unlikely. Um, yeah, I don't know at a certain point what level of unlikeliness then it becomes a problem, but it seems like if there's any case where it does, it would be this case. <laughs> Yeah, but I am thinking that you know one that in a best system kind of view that this would turn out. Yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, okay, so, you, so you've got three three moves in the table that kind of you can say it's a law or end of story. You can say well it's just, it's just, it's just a fact. Your your desire to, your, your your reason for saying it's unlikely isn't thought through properly. It's just a fact. Um, so yeah, you're in a whole universe of unlikelihood. Or you could say um, well it is really unlikely, but Sharp meant to that. It's only the third of those that I'm saying. I think is, is hard to get. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, Okay. Um, so let's. Uh, oh, I mean, one other thing that that might you know make you voice a little bit of skepticism is to actually look at some purported explanations of the past hypothesis and see whether they're not really just re, re invokings of the past hypothesis in a different guise, or whether they. Solve the problem in the first place, or whether they are so speculative, uh, or, or involve so much uh, positing of uh, extra ontology and all that, that, that it ends up uh, not being a good deal. Uh, the way I think of it sometimes is, you know, you know, suppose you, you know, you went to the dark side of the moon, and you saw on the dark side of the moon, there's a big, you know, uh, you know, carved out a, a, in the rock. Was a huge face, you know, 25 miles across of, of Abe Lincoln. You think, wow, what a, cons you know, what are the chances of, you know, all these meteor hits and stuff, you know, hitting out, uh, you know, a picture of Abe Lincoln, and then you know, come along and they say, well, no, I can explain that. You know, look at all those bulldozers on that side of the moon. But then all those bulldozers are even, you know, the chances of those things being there, even, you know, even lower. And so it's not really, you know, it's just pushing it back and not really giving an explanation. Correct. Just a tiny remark. It, it, it isn't that, you know, it, it's sort of, it, it might, somebody listening to remarks about saying it's a law might get the impression that there's some magic about uttering the words that it's a law that suddenly makes the problem go away. I guess that isn't the way I would think of it. The way I would think of it is, that the, the approach you're characterizing as saying it's a law is, a, is an approach that says something like, given all the evidence we have for the kinds of things that are likely and the kinds of things that are unlikely, okay? And if you understand probabilistic attributions rightly, and if you understand what it is to be evidence for and against probabilistic attributions rightly, and so on and so forth, it just doesn't turn out to be improbable. Okay. I mean, that's a longer yeah. version, I would say, of you're saying it's a law. There's no magic about uttering the words that it's a law. Okay. Right, right, right. Yes. Um, um, the, rather, the, 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 you know, the longer description of that strategy would be, oh, look, given, given the upshots of our empirical investigations, and to which kind of, you know, the best systematization we have of our empirical investigations into what's likely and what isn't likely, this isn't unlikely. Yeah. So just uh, at the beginning of the talk, you alluded to a kind of skepticism regarding the orthodoxy on understanding entropy when coupled with gravity. 
Uh, and I know you have a piece where you talk about this a little bit. And I was curious, is this, this reminds me of Ehrman's sort of like the past hypothesis, not even false kind of argument tonight. I mean, is this another way out of the, uh, uh, could you just elaborate on, on what your skepticism involves and is this a potential way out of the idea that Oh yeah, that, that feeds into okay. this kind of skepticism. So if it turns out to be really problematic to even even state the past hypothesis uh, in, in the language of more current and fundamental physics, uh, then this would be an extra reason to then go the initial way I was su suggesting. Um, yeah. I don't think the Ehrman thing is de decisive, uh, but I, I, I think it, it at least raises a worry. Um, and so, uh, actually, that relates to the thing I want to talk about next. Yeah. Even if you say it's a law, you could say maybe it's unlikely to be able to unify it with other laws. So then it's still on that. Um, no, I mean, but, but in terms of the actual you know, probability metric that, you're, that the science is producing, then it is likely. It's probability one. OK, let's turn to cosmology. And we could think about, you know, so things you'll talk about in the next week or so, uh, we could think about other problems. And there are others apart from these, of course. You could think about the horizon problem and the flatness problem. Are these real problems? Uh, inflation is, uh, you know, uh, supposed to solve these problems. Right, it's motivated uh, by solving these problems. So we can think about analogies and disanalogies between the step met case and, and these cases. Right? So here we look into different you know, uh, regions of the universe and see that they're the same, you know, uh, same temperature. They, on the standard model, they might, you know, they'll, they'll be causally disconnected, these, these different regions. Here you're looking at uh, departures, you know, uh, the Friedman evolution should uh, amplify, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, departures from zero curvature. And so by now, you know, there should be a lot more curvature. So to be this, so to be as flat as we are now, earlier it must have been really, 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 really flat. So you have now these uh, coincidences, and it's, you know, it, but it seems like, uh, it's too much to bear these coincidences, you know, that I look into all these different regions and see that the temperature is the same. Well, that's, you think, well, that, that's not like, you know, the Christmas twins. I can't let that go. You know, I need to come up with some sort of explanation for why, why this is the case. This is really unlikely. Well, but now there are, uh, you know, points you can make about this uh, and, and questions you can ask. Uh, and ask about whether whether it really is so unlikely, um, and whether you know the, is it the same kind of case as in the Statnet case, or is it or is it really different? Uh, so in some ways, on its surface, it looks the same. So when we look out in the Statnet case, we look out into all these different systems; they're all all, be, all obey thermodynamics. You know, oh my goodness, that's that's a, what a conspiracy! I'll, I'll explain the conspiracy by the past hypothesis. Here we're going to look at all these different directions, see the same, uh, the same uh, uh, temperature, or we're going to look in all these directions and see, uh, you know, flatness everywhere. How could this be? But note, if you think about, is it, uh, are these? There's a lot of problem. There are many problems in cosmology, and I'm not an expert by any means about this. Uh, but in first of all, you know, so if we think about here, you know, do we have uh, do we have a probability measure over the, over the space of solutions uh, such that uh, we can say that, the, that these things really are unlikely? Uh, that is, is there really a horizon problem? And is there really a flatness problem? And so there's a ton of controversy about this. Uh, so people, it's so very difficult to come up with measures uh, over a space of uh, solutions uh, in, in general relativity. You can look at just the Friedman solutions. You can look at the perturbed Friedman solutions. What space do you grab? And so you can put. And so in some cases, so you can do the you can do uh, the uh, Hawking uh, Stewart uh, measure, which is natural in some ways because it, it, it is. Uh, if, by, if by natural I mean you know uh, uh, invariant under the the evolution, the time evolution. 
Uh, but also, but on the other hand, I can pick other measures over different spaces, and so you've got this kind of uh, uh, anarchy in the in the field, really, where you've got all these different, you know, so here in these limited cases, you've got measures, and whether there's a horizon problem or a flatness problem will 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 differ over the measure. Right? I remember a paper when I was a, a grad student by. Uh, this is what I was thinking of, David, when I said before that in the cosmology case, uh, you didn't have it in the a priori or the empirical thing. By, by a priori, I meant something very, I didn't mean just a priori in general, but I was thinking of you know, a kind of Jamesian maximum entropy thing. And I remember seeing when I was a grad student uh, a paper uh, which uh, looked at you know, coming up with the measure via a kind of Jamesian recipe. And then uh, the flatness problem went away. The probability was one that the universe was going to be the way it is, and, and you know, uh, and you know, so then, it, so then it, you know, so then the flatness problem just goes away because you know, on that measure anyway, then the flatness problem will just go away because you should expect, you know, something very close to flat. And so there's all these different measures you could pick, and they either make the horizon problem come or go, or they make the, the flatness problem come or go. Sean Carroll, who will speak in week three, has a paper where uh, you know there is a there, there is a flatness problem, but there's no horizon problem. Or for the other, there's no flatness problem. No flatness yeah. problem. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's no flatness problem, but there's a horizon problem, uh, depending on those measures. And so then you can ask, you know, so you can then ask, you know, on the counterpart of each of these, is there a natural measure? And is there a natural measure? I don't know exactly how to answer that. You know, you'd have to stipulate what you mean by natural, uh, and then you might want to wonder which which space of solutions do I do I carve? Do I use? You know, is it just do I do? You know, do I, is, it, is it just over Friedman? Is it just over the Friedman plus perturbations? Is it over you know some wider range? Because actually, general relativity, of course, has many many other solutions apart from Friedman and Friedman perturbations. You can ask. You know, is that measure used in science? Yeah, so is it used elsewhere apart from actually just saying that there is the horizon problem and the flatness problem? Does, does that have independent justification? So I think in this case, you, know, you, would, you would say yes, because I, I look at all those subsystems where I've applied the, the statistical postulate, and again, 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 it's, it's, it's being used in science, and it has then this empirical justification. Does it in, in these cases? Do you have it in the first place? Uh, and so these are all, uh, I think, important questions in thinking about whether there really is, are, is a horizon problem, whether there really is a flatness problem. And but, but according to the way, there really is a question here what the, horizon, what the problem really is. Yeah. That's the way you presented it, and the way most what I see in most popular presentations, even from many experts, what's presented as a problem doesn't seem to be a problem at all from a naive point of view, which maybe the commonest the point of view, which the, what I mean is this, there's a sense in which the, the situation is exactly the opposite in five than in four. In five, as you put it, the problem is why should you have more or less uniform temperature? As you would have an equilibrium and there wasn't enough time to come to equilibrium. But the problem in four was that um, non-equilibrium in low entropy macrostate is so small compared to equilibrium, the whole space, or almost the whole space. Five, the question is, the problem, as you stated, it would seem to be, why should we be in equilibrium? Why should we be in the big set? We should, we should, we should much more expect to be in a small set. Now, when Steinhardt was asked the question of, is that the problem? He said, no, no, that's not the problem. The problem is that the uniformity of the temperature distribution is much, much greater than you would expect in equilibrium. There's no sense of equilibrium, though. Still, if you do any kind of way, if you do any attempt to do the counting, you, you would expect from what you know about equilibrium that the, what you thought was unlikely is really the, the thing you should most expect. Any, any case, Steinhardt said that was the problem was not what was normally presented, but really that it's a super uniformity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying, but I know what the problem is. I'm asking what the problem is, um, and uh, looking at 
analogies or disanalogies to the past. I, I would say, you know, before, I, I, I was thinking of it as more analogous than you are, because I was thinking of it as this is kind of, uh, we need a common cause explanation of all these correlated, uh, thermo, you know, there are all these systems that obey the thermodynamic generalizations, and we need the, this common cause to explain uh, why, why all these systems obey. But if you're thinking probabilistically in a naive way, there's nothing to explain. Uh, why not? Because the overwhelming majority of phase points will be such that you're, you're that the that the system is in equilibrium, which means more or less yeah. uniform well, temperature. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that's what you posit to then explain why all these thermo thermos. But then you don't have systems. to posit more than posit inflation if if, if you think what you actually naively originally thought was improbable is overwhelmingly probable. You're then not going to posit inflation to explain it. Uh, But that wasn't, the, that's not the problem, evidently. The equivalent of the Steinhardt. I mean, don't we still need a mechanic, mechanic, mechanical mechanism out of an explanation, even though we can give probabilistic reasons for why these systems are in equilibrium? Is it enough if you don't have any mechanism of how this could be? Right, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, so here's a perspective on inflation uh, that. I don't know enough about it to actually have it myself, but I can imagine. But I can, here's a perspective I can imagine, which is this: uh, in the textbooks, it gets motivated by the horizon problem, the flatness problem, the monopole problem, and all these other problems. Call these the kind of you know philosophical motivations. Uh, but really, uh, it makes sense to come up with a kind of mechanism. You know, from the point of view of coming up with some kind of fertile physics that was more fertile than just laying it all down to initial conditions. So if we could find a mechanism, then that's good. And then we posit something, you know, something really pretty simple, uh, you know, the scalar field, the, the original type of model, and then all the other types of models. Uh, and then, you know, wah! And, you know, and, uh, after, uh, in this millennium, we then have the WMAP, OB, all, all of these things, which then fit, uh, you know, empirically now with the, with, you know, with the theory. So then we just have good old-fashioned, I mean, if we do, I trust that we do, empirical confirmation of, the, of that model, which is then this mechanism, you know, giving you empirical confirmation, uh, predicting uh, uh, what we see. But uh, we could give up then all this uh, philosophical uh, motivation about uh, you know that it was unlikely that we knew it was unlikely that it was that it had to be wrong you know it had, it had to be explained in some way and just say well look no we we tried to you know we tried something we didn't want you know we didn't want science to end and just say posit some initial conditions we posit some some model it turns out it works that's awesome. We don't need to then go and say that there was this horizon problem and flatness problem. But now because we did say that there was this, you know, it was motivated by this horizon problem and flatness problem, you've got all these great scientists trying to come up with all these different measures, and you have this complete you know, anarchy about all these different measures, trying to come up with something which actually it doesn't do anyway, because if you think of the, the Penrose problem, uh, you know, where uh, you know, if you were trying to explain how uh, you're going to come up with a, a, a fine-tuned uh, macro state from something more generic, and you assume that the dynamics is, uh, in the classical case, so Bayes, uh, you know, uh, the Liouville theorem, or in quantum case, is unitary. Then you can, then you know that is then that explanation is then like an opposite of it's like an anti-thermodynamic one, which is Penrose's point. And so it's not really clear that the original ambitions of making likely uh, and the inflation posits the initial special initial conditions anyway as well. And so maybe what we should think is inflation possibly kicks ass as a science because it's got an empirical confirmation, but the original philosophical motivations uh, weren't actually, you know, didn't, don't necessarily stand up to scrutiny or uh, demand a lot of work and measure theory. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying that that's a possible view. Uh, and if somebody could shoot it down, that would be great. But if, on the other hand, uh, I wonder what people think. Yeah, let me get you what, what about this, this take on what needs explanation? So for these three problems, you, you pointed out that 
there are measures in which the situation is highly likely or highly unlikely. But what about just this idea that if you don't know which measure to use, this is a situation that demands explanation? Uh, if you already know why, the, why, why even think that you have to have a measure of the initial conditions? Well, that, the, 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 the normal way of stating it is that if, if your measure shows that a situation is unlikely, then it needs explanation. But, but even, even deeper, if you don't even understand which measure to use in the first place, then a, a problem which, which highlights that fact is a problem which is really interesting, which is, which is worth looking into, which is worth explaining, because it can then allow you to learn about new physics and about new, new things that you wouldn't have thought of. I, I, I think it's perfectly fine in any, any situation to say, I'm just going to accept this as a law. Those are my assumptions. I proceed from there. But, but then you can always revisit those. And you'll always have to explain new things. Uh, if you solve one problem, you always have to explain new problems. Would you still be trying to explain the initial conditions in that case, or would you explain the well, 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 both of them, because if you could find the right measure, then, then you would have an understanding about the initial conditions. And you, 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 need, you need criteria for finding which measures are, are better than others. And that, this, this, this is what all this is pointing to. We need, a, we need to know what criteria there are for distinguishing between which, which measures work and whatnot. It's sort of, I think that's where, where a lot of this is pointing. Yeah, so suppose in the past hypothesis case, we didn't think of the past hypothesis of a law, and we can then point out that, of course, there's you know an infinite number of measures, and we could make that thing you know likely or unlikely depending on you know, <coughs> the measure we pick. Uh, why should we pick the one we do? Well, then you can give an answer. I think. Because you could say you know that one is actually like, using science natural has also some empirical justification. On on this case, it's not so clear that you have that you know beforehand, uh, and so it's not so clear that. It's in the same uh, comparable kind of case. Um, I'm Joel Kingback. I'm going to be lecturing I, along with many other people next week uh, who really know a lot more about these subjects. I just wanted to give a couple of different perspectives very quickly. The horizon flatness problems and the uh, monocle problem were Goose's original motivation for introducing inflation, right. particularly the monocle problem. Right. But he was aware that Bob Vicky and others were very concerned about the horizon problem and the flatness problem. Now, the horizon problem was the Goose wrote the paper in 1980, published in 81. And the discovery of the different temperatures and different directions in the cosmic background radiation was only made in 1992. So, putting it in some kind of historical perspective, you have to understand that the thing that was bothering people was that. The temperature seemed the same in different directions, and the quadrupole term was discovered that's just due to the Earth motion. Finally, we started to see the fluctuations, and now we have enormous evidence of uh, tremendous amounts of data from especially the Planck satellite, which we used to say that on March 21st of this year. So now what we need to understand, what we need to explain is not the uniformity. That was the old problem. Well, yeah, yeah. The departure is Now, what we need to explain is the very, very detailed information that we get. And we have a beautiful explanation, which I helped to create. So that's an example of what the real issues are these days. Incidentally, this idea that equilibrium is the natural case is insane. It has nothing to do with the physics. This temperature, th this radiation was released at a time when different parts of the universe were not in causal contact. So any reference to equilibrium, which only makes sense if there's causal contact, simply doesn't make any sense. But Joe, Shelley's point was that thinking that that the existence of equilibrium requires a, a, an explanation in terms of previous causal contact seems out of place. That's just wrong, but that'll be explained so in great detail next wrong? week. Maybe yeah, explain it now. Yeah, you can explain now if you want, but uh, yeah, that, that, from, what, from what you've said, uh, I think it sounds like you're agreeing with me that the inflationary model, you know, so I'm saying it, it's uh, positive, gets an, uh, all this great, spectacular uh, empirical success in predicting all these fluctuations. Inflation, of course, plus other assumptions. 
Yeah, yeah. So that cold dark matter. Uh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and that's the reason to believe in inflation. Not that it solved these kind of you know, philosophical problems. Well, or do you, as I tried uh, to explain, these were motivations. Yeah, yeah. From so, a modern point of view, the history is relevant, but certainly not compelling. The, the real issue today is to explain the, the tremendous amount of data that we now have. These referred mainly to an absence of data. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, they, have, they were historically relevant, but, but they're certainly not the really interesting issues today. That, that's the main point I was trying to make. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's, you know, pretty, yeah, consistent with what we're So, so just to emphasize, in, in just a sense, that rather than the horizon problem, what we now, what we scientists now try to explain is the differences in temperature from place to place. Right. In different directions. Right. That's the really interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm saying, you know, if you look back at all those textbooks, and they motivated all by horizon and flatness and monopole, uh, yeah, then really the motivation now is something very different. Correct. And, and, and the elementary textbooks that repeat the old uh, story are really deceiving. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, you say we need scientists, and I mean, the fact is that we have lots of research papers and textbooks that are current, and people still use these motivations to argue for inflation. So that's great. I, I mean, I, and that seems to agree with what Craig just said. But I think it's important to point out to a large audience that these don't seem to be real problems. I mean, who would be um, Flatness is a more complicated issue. I agree that you can define it away. Uh, the horizon problem, this idea that the different regions, the, the, the size of the causally connected regions is a couple of degrees across uh, at the time the radiation was emitted. As we see it today, it's a couple of degrees across. So it is a real issue why the radiation has such a similar temperature. But, but that's not the big issue in the way science is actually being done these days. I mean, yeah. No modern learned paper. Oh, I get that. I'm not saying it is. Right. Yeah. So, so the real issue is actually trying to explain the observed temperature distribution and the observed polarization distribution and the temperature polarization cross correlation. And this is what the papers are all about. You say they learn papers, that is the definition of what you have to learn. The papers are being published in the, the scientific literature, not the textbooks, oh. but, but the papers in the main journal. I do think what Casey said is right. That, uh, and by the way, I should say, you know, if anything I just said was at all intelligible, it's really due to Casey uh, and not me. Uh, but on the other hand, if nothing was, then he's to blame. But uh, you know, it, it does raise a question, though, if if that's the only thing that's going on, there are all these people trying to show that there is a flatness problem, or that there is a, you know, uh, one of these kind of conspiracy problems by devising the right measure, uh, by trying to show that inflation is likely. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of work in measures and, and that, that maybe when you look at, uh, you know, with your uh, sort of skeptical eyes, you wonder whether it really is necessary anymore. Uh, let me see what time it is. And uh, I think there and there. So it is, I think you expressed some worries earlier on. You just, I guess, alluded to that about what, what space you should choose to work with. Um, I just wanted to say there are some theorems that have been. There's this one theorem called the Ehlers Gehrig Socks theorem, which folks have appealed to for the purpose of moving from data we have on the cosmic background radiation to um, a space, namely a Friedman Lemaitre and Walker space. And uh, there are folks who use this kind of reasoning. Uh, even without the assumption of the Copernican principle. And there are folks who have used this reasoning without the Copernican principle and in light of the fact that the cosmic microwave background radiation has, has these you know, fluctuations. It is, you know, the universe isn't perfectly uniform with respect to this radiation. Um, so that's interesting that you can move from that data to more specific details about the nature of the space. But the other sort of like second question is just, I'm just I completely puzzled and confused. I, uh, there are a number of papers that I could cite which understand the horizon problem to actually be a problem. Uh, and so I'm like in this array right now. So, so uh, you know, Steinhardt, for example, calls it the causal horizon problem. There really is this question of 
how it is that the universe got to be the way it is in terms of this large scale structure as we look out past many light years, in light, in light of the fact that there isn't enough time, and in light of the fact that, that the particle or cosmological horizons are not in causal contact with each other. And I, and I thought that inflation was providing you with a, an answer to the how did, how did this structure come to be question. Uh, but we're, we're saying that well, no. this isn't a problem, that, that no, well, I think it's, it's a measure. It can, it can provide an explanation of how this came to be, but it might not be one that is itself uh, more likely than, uh, you know, it, okay. it just so, having come to be. So suppose we get the measure, and, the, you know, on this measure, everything, you know, this kind of stuff comes out likely. I can still ask the question, how did it come to be at all, right? And I could appeal to something like inflation. That's still a perfectly legitimate question. Yeah, yeah. On your view. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay, all right, yeah. okay. So, uh, and we just don't ask, you know, what, how likely was inflation and how likely was it before, you know, how likely was that state before anyway? And so it's, it's not in the game of making it all likely. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's agnostic about all that. Okay. And I think Joel is not denying the horizon problem that it's a problem, but that um, it's not the main motivation for believing inflation today. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. Just a quick comment on, on measures. Uh, where the measure issue comes up is uh, in comparing different regions in some much bigger space than the space we actually can see. And uh, so, in particular, on issues of the multiverse. And that's going to be the subject of several lectures next week by people who are real experts, in particular Anthony here. Yeah, so that will actually, yeah, so that is another point that didn't come up. Uh, but that will be a case where if you believe in a multiverse, well then problems four and five uh, look a little more similar because in the, here you have all these subsystems which are obeying thermodynamics in four. There you would then have all these subsystems which will have a certain statistical profile, just like in the thermodynamic case. But if you didn't have all the subsystems, so if you didn't believe in the multiverse, then they, then they won't look as similar. Um, yeah. So I just want to make sure I understand the claim. So is the claim that I don't think there is a claim. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. So I was just. It seems like what you're saying is something needs explaining. Just that it's particularly unlikely on a measure that's used for science is natural and that has a legal justification. I'm, I'm, I'm describing that view, so there's that view. Okay, so on what, on what measure is the, that's used in science that's natural and that has a critical justification is the past hypothesis not unlikely? Uh, yeah, so, well, it's unlikely with respect to the standard measure over the space, over the full okay. space. But it seems like, it seemed like what you wrote down below the past hypothesis thing was supposed to be we're supposed to support the claim that past hypothesis isn't even claiming. I just didn't understand that. Oh, uh, no, here, here we're uh, imagining that we, we're in the, you know, we, we need to, you know, we're thinking that we need to explain it because it's unlikely with respect to that measure. And then, but then maybe down the road we, you know, do some philosophy and end up saying that it's a, it's a law. Okay, that's fine. And then, okay, and then the arrows to the question marks. So that's, so that's supposed to be, so do we have a measure in the first place? Yeah. Uh, is it used? Uh, is it natural? Uh, and is it empirically, does it come up shown in purple? And it's a problem again, if only if we have this measure and oh, uh, the actual yeah. state of the universe is very unlikely on that. Uh, some appropriate level of course rating. Yeah, so that would be a way of then, yeah, so if you had all of those things, then that would be a way of saying it's unlikely, that would be of the same status as when you say that the past hypothesis was unlikely. And so the same consideration can play out, yeah. it has to be a law, or it has to be explained. Yeah, or you could just say, no, I don't have a, a I don't really have a measure that satisfies those uh, desiderata, and therefore I don't think that that's the problem that the inflation solves, it's some other problem. So, okay, so, so if you don't have that measure, then the claim is that there's a disanalogy between the past hypothesis and the mm -hmm. professional. Okay, that's yeah. 
Okay, uh, so, well, we end at 12, right? I mean, okay. if, if you can certainly go on for a few minutes if you like. Well, just very quickly, I'll take the hands. Uh, and, yeah, so, so following up on uh, just jumping ahead to the multiverse a little bit, you know, the kind of explanation for the fast hypothesis in the multiverse scenario would be that you have many different initial entropy states, only some are low entropy according to some measure, and we, we have to, by observational selection, find ourselves living in those you know, universes in which the fast hypothesis is true in order to get the second law, and in order to get all the things that are required for, for us to conceivably exist at all. So what do you think about that kind of an explanation? Oh, of the... Of the past hypothesis. And then, of course, the... Yeah, I, like, I, what I, I, you I use, hate it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what measure you use there is, is, is much, much under debate. Right. But that's the kind of explanation. And then, of course, then you have to explain your justification for this measure. So you, you do have to explain something new. But, but you can make an argument about whether you moved on to a, a better problem. It's not obvious whether you, you moved on to a better or worse problem. Right. Yeah. What? Casey? Uh, I just mean, compared them to, um, just to see like, where, where they're different. I'm thinking, so the first thing, probability measure, um, any kind of measure you have on a base space or something like that, it's... You just pick it because it's like a continuous space, and the big measure is the one that makes sense. But there's nothing that picks out the big measure for a big space. You say that's the one we're going to use, right? Um, well, so there are. I don't think it's like the so specs the is, is like you're, you know, you, to, to get to the point where you're saying that something's unlikelihood based on that that measure. There's also a, a step to think about it as probability, because the big measure is not a probability measure, and so you, you know, not all. Uh, applications of the probability measure. So, I mean, there's some interpretation there just to even look at a phase space and say that we can interpret it as, as a probability measure. In that sense, it's similar to kind of the measure problems that you think about in multi-members or, or whatever. It's like, well, you need to give an argument that we can interpret this as probability in the first place. And that's a hard argument to make. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, well, Shelley would probably agree with you, I think, there, and think of it just in terms of typicality instead of. Probability, is that right? I certainly wouldn't think of it in terms of probability, at least not not when, not except in a very um, intuitive way. But I will, with the recognition that's often going to get me into problems, it's not really probability I have in mind. Okay, with that, uh, well, I'm done. Uh, thank you.